Take two. Hey, come on in. Admission is free. Grab a bowl of popcorn, extra butter, of course, and find a seat smack dab in the middle. It's time for Finding Christ in Cinema, episode number 64. I'm Michael. And I'm Brendan. Join us, and together we'll dig deeper into the silver screen classics of yesteryear, as well as the box office hits of today. We'll take a closer look at the stories they tell and see if we find the face of Jesus looking back. We're going to explore the deeper meanings of these films, their plots and their twists, the characters and their choices, and how we can relate them to the gospel of salvation and ultimately our Christian walk. You are tuned in to Finding Christ in Cinema on the GCT Network. This is your Great Commission Transmission. Brendan, you sound different today. Are you under the weather? Well, actually, just a little bit that, too. However, <laughs> that would have not stopped me from coming to the studio. What did stop me from coming to the studio was uh, was an overheating engine. Oh, no! <laughs> so, uh, Sheila, the 1998 Ford Explorer, she is in the shop right now. Uh... And, uh, well, ho hopefully it's not too bad. Yes, everybody keep uh, Sheila in your prayers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so anyway, she, she appreciates it. We are using Google Hangouts today, which is totally different. So although we are live, if, if you didn't catch the, uh, the, the tweet that we sent out, um, you, you're we're on Facebook, you're missing out. Because we're actually on YouTube today, broadcasting live using Google Hangouts on Air. We've used it one time before, and that was a fiasco. And then this second time of using it, it this almost was a fiasco as well. I'm not happy with Google Hangouts on Air at all. Um, we're used to using uh, Ustream and pumping that video into our website over at gctnetwork.com slash live. But, Brendan, I, I, I think it's going to turn out just fine. Oh, good. Good. Me too. All right. Hey, uh, last week, what did we talk about? The Dark Knight. Yes. Oh, big film. Any okay? I failed to mention that my main point is, which is the one that I ended with, um, that that uh, Batman, the Dark Knight, is not the hero that we deserve, but the hero that we need. Just as Jesus is not the God that we deserve, He is the God that we need. That whole line of thought. I owe that all to my son, Micah. He came up with the whole thing. Really? Yes. I said, I, I pulled him aside and said, son, because he's a big Dark Knight fan. Son, we're going to be covering the Dark Knight, and it's a dark movie. It's heavy. I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about. Any ideas? Well, yeah, I do have an idea. And he, and he said that. I said, there you go. <laughs> so... All uh, big props to uh, to Micah and longtime listeners and people that have listened to me for years on several, on on many other shows know that Micah was a co-host of mine on a uh, podcast that we used to do about uh, Tolkien's Middle Earth and so uh, some listeners will get a kick out of knowing that Micah uh, is uh, the brains behind uh, my point uh, last episode the Dark Knight anything from you. Uh, yeah, I got uh, just a, a little feedback from our friend, FCC's very own Richard Chilton. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and there's a reason why I'm not putting this in, in the feedback section, because, I, you know, it will, it will spur an afterthought or an addendum. Okay. Uh, he said that even if, a, even if we watch this movie with a non-believer, talk about The Dark Knight, it still may not explain the the problem of pain. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and and you know, you know, I, I thought about that. I was like, you know, you're right. And even if they just listen to this podcast, to our, to our episode covering that movie, that also still may not fully explain the problem of pain. And is there an explanation to the problem of pain? There, there is. Is there? But, oh, no, well, hear me out. Okay. My explanation is relative to my understanding, uh, but, my own sub subjective yes. viewpoint. Yes. And each, and I honestly think each person will have to come to their own terms uh, on, answering, on answering that question. Right. Did, did Richard offer up any, uh, any thoughts on that as to a better way of explaining the problem of pain? Uh, no, he didn't. He just uh, he was just concerned that, uh, 
you know, it may have se- it may have seemed like we we touted the episode as the answer, as having the one and only true answer. When, uh, you know, I I think we just were attempting to give an answer yes. instead of the answer. An answer as found in the Dark Knight. Yes, absolutely. So, and- so I would agree with Richard that uh, sure the movie and the podcast may not answer it for some people, I, I, but I do believe that they will help the answer be understood by others. Absolutely, because when you are talking about that question, there is no single answer to the question. And so it's going to be, uh, it's going to be based on situation or it's, uh, depending on who is hearing the message at, at the time. It's either going to resonate or it will partially resonate or it will not resonate at all. It will it will plant a seed. Yes. Or it will water a seed that's already there. Or or nothing's going to happen. Or it's going to fall on a dead seed. Uh, there are people. Yeah. Like, yeah. You mentioned um, uh, Stephen Fry last episode. Um, I'm thinking of people like Richard Dawkins. Those are people yep. that that there is a there there's a very real possibility and a real chance that nothing will ever penetrate their heart. Um, they use the problem, the problem of pain, as the proof that there is no God. Yeah. And so, are you going to be able to give an adequate answer to everybody? No, nope, you sure aren't. Um, and and so we appreciate Richard for for what you say, and and so that we can uh, make sure that we acknowledge that, and our you know our listeners know that, regardless. So, um, but but boy, Brendan, I I think you really hit a home run on that episode, bringing it down to empathy and showing what Bruce Wayne, uh, a.k.a. Batman, uh, suffered all of his life. And he's, uh, uh, as, as Jesus was, was uh, described, a man uh, that was you know, familiar with sorrow, a man of sorrows. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, beautiful, a beautiful picture. And that, again, is the, the, the Savior, the God that we need. A man that's a, that's uh, acquainted intimately. You, with sorrow. you could say, you could say a man of constant sorrow. Oh, because I know I, along with half of the other listeners, were thinking it. <laughs> so, so I had to say that. All right, Brendan. Uh, anything else on the Dark Knight? No, I I think I'm ready to go to the movies. Here we go. So I was sitting in this coffee house, and this old man at the table next to me struck up a conversation. He said you had an amazing story. Let's see then. Where to begin? I was born and raised in one of the most beautiful places on earth. It was a time filled with wonder that I'll always remember. But when my family chose to move our zoo halfway around the world, that is when my greatest journey began. Next part of the story you will find hard to believe. Thank you. 
an absolutely beautiful beautiful movie i've never even seen this film before because every time i ask somebody what it's about they say it's about a guy stuck on a lifeboat with a tiger <laughs> oh that's not what it's about that's what uh, you've always told me well that's what that's what we see for the majority of the film but after revisiting it now i can tell you that that is not what the film's about what a beautiful film brendan this I was tempted to say, let's not even talk about Christian themes in this film. Let's use this as an opportunity to talk about storytelling. Uh, yeah, definitely. What do you think as a storyteller of, of this, um, this adaptation of this book? Well, um, I'm really struck by the, the adult pie uh, in his telling of this story. But but the thing is, in his character, the way he, the way he says it, really, he says, "Look, I can tell you this story, or I can tell you this story. Neither change the effects, or neither change the events of the sink of the sinking of the ship, and I still suffered." And then he kind of puts the ball into the audience's court. He says, "Which would you rather believe?" Yeah, and, and you know that just it kind of proves the well not proves but it attests to the power that a storyteller can have over the impression of a certain thing. It really is. A, um, this is a parable. Yeah, uh, in the classic sense of the of the word, I think. Okay, Let, let's give some shout outs here because there's some fantastic acting in this film uh, like i was blown away uh I, I mean starting with adult pie um i don't really know how to say his first name irfan khan and i have seen him most recently in what jurassic world yeah he was the guy that owned the island right yeah and, and he was one of my favorite characters in fact when we get to that film i'm gonna focus on him um and then the only other place that i'd seen him was in uh, the amazing spider-man um what was it the first one i, I believe so where he yes is, he's representing the financier who is uh uh floating the the bill for um for that uh, the technology for rejuvenation and and, and things like that it, um you know so he's a bad guy or not a very nice guy um so I've only seen him in those two roles, and they were drastically different roles, and so I appreciated him right off the bat for having that range. But then yeah. seeing him in this film, which I didn't know he was in this film, I was blown away by his acting ability. What did you think? Uh, really, everything you said, I was... Uh, have you, you haven't seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire? No. We need to add that to the list. Okay. We need to add that to... Patron Saint... Oh, sorry, I got crazy. Sorry, sorry. To Patron Saint Philip presents... The, the list. list! I only have the echo today. Oh, man! Yeah, that's what you get for not coming into the studio. Thank it. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll need to get that on there. And, he, and in that film, he plays uh, the police inspector. And for... For those familiar with Some Dog Millionaire, he's the one that questions the uh, the well the the guy that wins, and I'll explain that to you later, Michael. Okay. Uh, but I was already familiar with uh, Mr. Khan. Ah, that's funny, <laughs> Mr. Khan. <God! laughs> oh, sorry. I, I, yeah, I knew you would do that. Yes. So, so, but no, I was I was I was pleasantly pleased. With his performance in Life of Pi, uh, especially, especially when he gets to the part of the story that are harder to tell, and you can tell that he's even struggling telling this reporter, the, or this this writer, you can tell that he's struggling with that. Yeah. And uh, just really powerful moments from him. 
a very a commanding actor, I think. Yeah. Uh, the mannerisms, the the nuance, uh, everything, uh, just a joy and a pleasure to watch, and and I believed every minute of it. But then we have to go to the guy who spent who most of the movie was just focused on one guy. Um, and that's Pi at age, what, 17, 18, 19 years old. Yeah, somewhere in there. Uh, Suraj Sharma. Wow. Sure. That, that was my guess. Yes. Oh, thoughts on his performance? Oh, uh, masterful. Yes. <laughs> I thought, uh, I mean, I mean, he... he not just because of his of his character, but he as the actor really does carry this film. Yes, yep. he he really does, and it's uh, from the scenes where you know it's storming around the raft. Oh, especially when the ship sinks, uh huh, and, and he's hanging on to the boat. Yes, and he's he's yelling to his mom and dad and his brother that he's sorry. That scene gets me every time. Yeah. And I just I can see even though there's plenty of water going around his face, you can see the the actual tear. Yeah. And I, I know as an actor that's hard to muster up, yeah. especially in that kind of environment. So uh, you know, and then and then even going through the physical bodily transformation that he goes to that he goes through to show how long he's been on the boat. Uh, and when he finally gets on the shore, you can just see on the Mexican shore, you can just see how how far he went. Yep. And that's I mean that's dedication. You know what? It was reminiscent to me of Tom Hanks in his his role in Castaway. Exactly. Yeah. That is method acting taken to uh, you know to its logical conclusion, isn't it? Yeah, that is true. Um, yes, he just he 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 owned every scene that he was in. Um, they had they really hung this movie on his shoulders, and he was able to bear the weight. Amen. Yeah, I agree. Okay, what about uh, the fellow who plays his dad? Is it uh, Adil uh, Hussein? Adil Hussein. Yeah, I... uh, very stern. Uh, very. You could tell he was he was trying to portray wisdom, especially in the dinner table scene, where uh, where Pi claims that he's following three different religions. Yes, and that that just that dialogue with oh, that you know was a he, great dialogue. In fact, I have that clipped for. Uh, uh, for oh, good, yes. good. We'll hear that. Uh, um, and, I, and just go ahead. I think that not only um, his. You're know, wanting to convey wisdom, but there's still there's a lot of compassion in there. There's a love for his son, even though he may not understand, you know, the direction that his son's going in because of his own philosophies. Being uh, of the uh, what what they what they say, New India or the New India? Oh, yeah, the New India. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, you know, shedding well, it would be like the Enlightenment, uh, uh, really. Um, and but he was still compassionate. Uh, uh, you know, when he comes in and, and uh, when uh, the boys are, you know, and Pi's wanting to feed uh, Richard Parker and the dad comes in, you know, concerned, this is my boy and, you know, and wants to teach them a lesson. It's not because he's a cruel man and it's not because he uh, uh, has no love. It's because he is the opposite. He is a, a good man that loves his family. And he's able to portray that in, in, you know, even even when I'm looking at this as a Christian and thinking, you know, this guy's an atheist and, you know, I don't you know I don't have any regard for that. But I sure have regard for this man. And he actually makes some of the most powerful points, um, at least that I was able to glean from this movie. But a phenomenal actor, phenomenal actor. Yeah. Oh, Everybody, yeah. Everybody, even uh, uh, <laughs> uh, what's his name? Uh who was the uh, the cook? What's that guy's name? Oh, I, I can't. Uh, Gerard Depardieu. Yes. <laughs> I like that little uh, exchange in there, and it was great uh, um, getting back to uh, Pai's dad and, and Adil Hussein, you know, portraying that, him standing up for his wife. You know, hey, she's a vegetarian. And you don't treat her like that. It, it's just it's great. Uh, and her name, uh, Gita Patel. 
Gita or Gita, probably. I, I'd say Gita. Yeah. But uh, again, this this is an actress that we that we probably would not have even heard of were not for this movie. I love that these are you know? all Indian actors, or at least yeah. born. Um, yeah. I I don't know. Uh, I. Brendan, we're a lot alike, and I just love all the God's creatures, and I love different cultures and seeing the beauty in them. Yeah. And there's something very endearing about the Indian um, culture to me. Um, hmm. and, and I think they're beautiful people, and I think that, that they have beautiful philosophies that work um, even in my own Christian worldview, um, able to make certain things fit. But but what's more important is seeing what's common, the commonality between us. They're people, and 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 I think that makes it even more beautiful when you are uh, appreciating as you're discovering other cultures. Yeah, you know, and you find you find that sometimes the differences get you know even further than you thought at at the beginning. But the realization that hey, we're all God's creatures get stronger does that make any sense yeah it makes perfect sense that actually kind of ties into what what i really think is the message of this movie okay well good we'll yeah. get to that in just a moment but i think that we should yeah. we should spend a minute giving some some uh some props to ang lee yes as director yes sir uh, i i well, uh, go I ahead have, Okay, I am really only familiar with him for his, uh, the 2003 um, film Hulk. Uh, yeah. And the way Wait. that he, that's the one with... Um, Eric Bana. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I love the way that one is filmed because it is very much like a comic book. The cinematography and, and everything is set up so that it, it conveys the idea of yes, this is definitely a comic book movie, and I right. that's I really enjoyed that film, um, and then I have seen parts of um, or at least a little bit of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, um, and it was absolutely stunning, you know, visually. I think that he is a very visual man, and which would I mean, that just makes sense. Well, and it carries over to Life of Pi in spades. Yes. Yeah. So, so you know, I mean, visually speaking, let's talk about that. Just, just aesthetically for a moment. This film. Uh, there's that word, aesthetics. Yes. Uh, oh, go oh, go ahead with your question. It's just, <laughs> I mean, it just portrays the fantastic all along. I've only, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna tell you, I've only watched this movie one time, and that was yesterday. And, and um, so I didn't know anything about the movie other than, as I said before, the only thing people would tell me is about a guy in a lifeboat with a tiger. <laughs> and, uh, and I was just blown away with the, how fantastic this Oh, you know what? I want to do this right now. Give out a big, fat spoiler alert. Yes. If you have not watched Life of Pi yet, stop the podcast now because, and then come back after you watch because we will spoil this movie. In yeah. fact, starting right now, <laughs> it wasn't until the very end, Brendan, where I where I said, "No wonder this movie was so fantastic visually speaking. No wonder, because it's a parable." Yeah. Um, and so uh, that the the skills of Ang Lee, I think. Um, can I say that this is like? Perhaps his magnum opus, or is that going too far? Yeah, I, I yes, you could say that, and and I would I would say yes, I agree with you. Okay, and so what do you think that he was trying to do with the visuals? Well, obviously, uh, just uh, that ties back into that word aesthetics. He was trying to to engage the audiences as fully as he could through a movie screen. And that's why that's why the film got a 3D release. It was released in IMAX 3D. Uh, you can get it in uh, 3D Blu-ray. You know, if you have the right equipment, you can get that experience. Um, that's why, you know, going back to the shipwreck scene, 
that's why it's so intense. You've got all the rain, you've got the waves, uh, all the all the catastrophe going on the screen. He's trying to <clears throat> not arrest your senses, but at least detain them and get your attention for a little bit to fully engage them. And that's it's it's, it's very hard to do on a movie screen. I but think- I think. I think Angley in this film he does it. I think that a good word uh, is also arrest. Like he arrests your your senses. Yeah. It, you know, it's almost. I mean, he it held me captive. I had no interest in seeing this movie. I had none. It's about a guy in a lifeboat with a tiger. What in the world can this movie be? You know, uh, and and I was absolutely captivated. I was held under arrest. By uh, Ang Lee for that whole two hours. Um, so I'm I'm very thankful. Why are we doing this movie? Do we have to give a shout out to anybody? Was this a request or anything? Uh, this was a request, actually. Actually, when we first started, a while back. Wow. Uh, this this was request, uh, requested by one of my fellow MTSU friends. Uh, her name is Noelle Collins. Ah. Uh, uh, she requested it on in a Facebook message, uh, you know, just well, it wasn't really a message; it was more of a comment. But I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and she and actually, as of this past summer, she and actually, really, the past couple weeks, uh, as of this recording, she she has been engaged. Oh. And so you know, congratulations. Yes. And and we hope we do this film right by you. Yes, yes, uh, because when people request movies, a lot of times they already have ideas in their head, and yeah, there's a reason why they are requesting us to take a look at it because you know we come up with some off the wall stuff. <laughs> so That's if, right, we do. If if nothing else, the entertainment factor about how crazy are these guys going to get with this movie is uh, is always present. So <laughs> yeah, all right, Noel, we we do hope that uh, that we do it justice for you. Um, let's go ahead and start. Let's jump into it. And this is there's a lot to talk about. There is. I'm going to lovingly entitle this this whole segment The Thorn in Pious Flesh or Taming the Tiger of the Thole. Oh. <laughs> oh okay, so yes. Spoiler alert, Michael hit it again. Here you go. The tiger is Pi, and <gasps> Pi is the tiger. What? Who? Wait. <gasps> I don't get it. Yes. Well, that is that is your spoiler alert. Yes. And that that really is that's supposed to be the effect of this whole film. When did it? Uh, I, when did you know? When. Storyteller Pi, you know, finish his story, and then he's recounting to the writer of another story that he had to tell these insurance claims yeah. people. Yes. And he told them the second story about how it wasn't a zebra, a hyena, an orangutan, and a, a tiger on the boat. The second story was about the cook, the happy Buddhist, yes, Pi's mother, and Pi, yes, and then once certain parallels are drawn, you know, as it's clicking for the writer, it's clicking for us as the audience. So you think that that uh, is was it designed? Was that second story because that's when 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 the light bulb went off on me as he's telling the story to the Japanese. Uh, insurance uh, adjusters is basically what they were. Yeah. Um, as he was telling the story, you know, I'm thinking, okay, um, he's just gonna. This is gonna be a montage, and it's gonna be edited, so it's just you know, uh, uh, cross fading into as the story's going on. You know, I was expected it to be truncated, but as it kept going, that's when I said, wait a second. Now this is what really happened. So I did. I I came to that conclusion before the writer came to the conclusion. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say I think it was kind of a a purposeful delayed response. 
So that was what what the writer of the book and more uh, specifically Ang Lee was. That was, I mean, would that be the catharsis? Is that when it, or is that just the big reveal and 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 people should have understood at that point? Well, see, I mean, that's the thing. Like up until that point, we really had no reason to doubt the adult pie storytelling. Because right. because the transition, even like even from the introduction of Richard Parker, uh, we you know we, we fully believe that he is the tiger that was at at his dad's zoo, and that he was on the ship as they were trans moving the zoo from uh, from India to you know Canada. Right. We you know we fully believe that. However. And I and I think Ang Lee even gives us this cue. Whenever the writer and Pi are at the bench by the little pond, the little watering hole or whatever, yes. it's at that moment where Pi himself even says, Okay, have I left anything out? And then, you know, and then the writer goes into, Well, you told me this, you told me this, you told me that and that. And then Pi says, Okay. Here's the story, okay. or or something to that effect. You can tell there's a definite break in the narrative. Ah, and I think that is Ang Lee and uh, and the original author of the book. That is them being, that is them giving us the audience the heads up. It's it, for me. It reminds me of Jesus saying, "What is the kingdom of heaven like?" Or you know how can I put this to you? That, that's this is where the parable begins. Yeah, yes, exactly. He uh, he's using he's using the real life situation and then crafting a parable yeah. around it. Oh man, it's beautiful. Because, the, well, let's be honest though, the parable is a little more palatable. Oh yes, and and actually that's something I want to bring back to you know shout outs for the writers. Yes. Um, especially the writer, the author of the book, Jan Martel, and the screenplay, uh, David Magee. They didn't show the second story like they showed the first story. For for the first story, you know, that's the whole movie. Yeah. But for the second story, it's just a monologue. Yes. It's a soliloquy of Pi sitting in the bed, and all we see on screen is Pi sitting in the bed, and that forces us as the audience to rely on our imagination. And that actor, that's, I mean, that was, that was his shining moment. He's showing yeah. the whole movie, and you're thinking, how could it get any better than this? And then he just turns it up to 11. Yeah, yeah yes, he does. And, and that, well, it was very powerful. I like what you said, though, that the, uh, that the first story was more palatable. It was more palatable palatable even though it was utterly fantastical right? yeah and and, and and the traditional sense fantastic and even what the writer says incredible yes you know unbelievable like I seriously am having a hard time believing that this happened even though you say it's true but the truths that were conveyed through that story through that parable were more powerful coming through that more palatable yet more fantastical story. And that is really why Jesus spoke in parables. Because to those who had ears to hear, they would hear what the Son of Man was saying. Just like we get to hear, or we're going to attempt to, uh, to... Well, we're going to tell the audience, the listeners, what we heard in that parable. Yeah. So... Oh wow! Fantastic. Okay, so now now that we're set, we really have, be, and because of this parable, because of this uh, this double sided story, yeah. we really have a fuller picture of Pi as a man. Yes, because in the parable, Pi is is the ideal man. The, uh, the, uh, the man that people want to be, but Richard Parker is the natural man. Right. 
Richard Parker is the is that ferocious inner being. Yes. That that people everywhere either they they try to keep in check or they don't. Can I uh, interject with a verse that I was going to use with uh, to bolster my points? Because my points, I'm really going to interject, and you're going to you know, you're going to be the bookends here. Okay, uh, sure, yeah. Um, but what you were just saying out of First Corinthians chapter two, eleven and twelve, verses eleven and twelve, for who among men knows the things of a man except the man's spirit within him? Doesn't that describe you know? Uh, Hi, in that in that instance, he knows what him, and and there's that tiger there. Uh oh, did I just lose you? Did I, did you just drop? No, no, oh, okay. no, I'm still here. It made a strange noise, and then then it goes. You know, so too, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Uh, now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things that are freely given to us by God. Um. So, uh, so and the point being, uh, you know. He knew, Pi knew who that tiger was in his story. And he tells it to us and as he's telling it to the Japanese uh, insurance adjusters. Yeah, yeah, Pi the whole time knows who the tiger is. And, I, you know, it's kind of crafty on his part that he, that he actually chooses a tiger to describe this, you know, this inner man. Yeah. Now, I, just, I just think it's pretty cool. Absolutely. Uh, and I, w I would say what I get from this whole thing is this is this is really a story about Pi the man trying to tame and train his natural self, trying to keep it in check. Okay. Because as we as we learn at the end of the story, uh, Pi had to kill somebody. Yeah. Or at least he felt like he had to kill, and that you know that you know not just to say that breaks one of the original ten commandments, but I, th I honestly that that goes against the law that is written on the human heart that God Himself wrote on the human heart that goes against that law, and this is a story about him having to cope with that, and it re and it really. Uh, okay, so back to the parable. Uh, let's let's listen to that to that first sound clip, where uh, you know Pi, you know, initially starts believing that he has to, he is going to have to coexist with with this tiger, Richard Parker, and there needs to be some order. Here it comes. For castaways who must share their lifeboats with large, dangerous carnivores. It's advisable to establish a territory as your own. Try this method. Step 1. Choose a day when waves are moderate but regular. Step 2. With the lifeboat facing into the waves, making the ride as comfortable as possible, blow your whistle soothingly. Step 3. Turn the lifeboat sideways to the waves, accompanied by harsh, aggressive use of the whistle. With sufficient repetition, the animal will associate the sound of the whistle with the discomfort of seasickness. Seasickness. A seasick tiger is the last thing that you want. You're going to have to unmute your microphone there. Okay. I did. Okay, that, that's, what, <laughs> that's what I realized you're pointing at. Okay, yes. Um, so, this, so this is really Pi's first attempt, attempt in trying to uh, reestablish order on the, on the lifeboat. And this is... This is very, very important into understanding this dynamic between Pi as the man and Richard Parker as the as the natural man. And there's a quote we'll get to later from the movie, but I want to go ahead and set this framework in right now. All right. There, there is a difference between taming and training. Yes, yes. And uh, they both require. Uh, thing A and thing B, or person A or person B, you know. Dr. Seuss here, cat in the hat. Yes, thing one and thing two, yes. Uh, now, thing A is superior to thing B, 
no matter what thing B believes or doesn't believe about thing A. Just for example, uh, we could say that humans are thing A and animals are thing B. All right. Or we could stretch that to say God is thing A and humans are thing B. Absolutely. You know, uh, animals are to humans as humans are to God. And, hey, that's not a bad thing. I don't know what to tell you. Doesn't bother me. No, ex exactly. And we see in this uh, this scene, he is trying to, Pi is trying to tame Richard Parker. Pi is trying to tame that uh, that natural self, that uh, really that depravity. Would you say that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, so... Well, it's the, it's the wild animal in him. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And there is... And really, I, I, I've, I've outlined these definitions. Hopefully, they'll work for you. To tame is to subdue, master, and domesticate. Okay. Okay, now by subdue... That means to conquer and reduce to subjection. Oh, I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Cain. Oh my goodness. Of, oh, of Cain. Oh, go ahead. It, it, you know when uh, after he was his his sacrifice was rejected by God, and uh, he's mad, and God says, "Why the long face? You know, why is your your countenance uh, you know brought down? If you do well, everything's going to be good. But if you don't, sin." is crouching at your door and its desire is to subdue uh, master, to conquer to reduce you to subjection yes oh that oh that's clever sir that was clever uh and actually uh master is the next little word i have on my list that means to exert control and authority over again this is what pi is trying to do to the tiger Right. And then that last term, very, very specific, domesticate, to make worthy of living inside the house. Oh, that's or to, ma to make worthy in sharing the same living space. Interesting. Okay, so, again, this is, this is all what Pi is trying to do to Richard Parker. Now let's, let's so bring it to... You have oh, to say it properly. Richard Parker, say it. <laughs> it just sounds wonderful that way. I love <laughs> Richard Parker. Yeah, Parker. I love it. Uh, so okay, so let's let's bring this into a uh, human and animal example. All right. Let's say you're you know you're driving down the road and oh look there's a stray dog. There's no collar. There's no leash. You're trying to uh, you know find out where this thing belongs or who this belongs to, but you don't. You want to take it home. However, this home, this dog is a very wild dog. He's been out in the wilderness for some time, and he's a little rough around the edges. That's what my wife says about me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so... Oh, oh, you know what? I, I thought my jokes were bad. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, if that person wants to share a home with that dog... That dog will have to be tamed, or else it could uh, it could ruin the house. It could uh, you know chew up furniture. It could uh, ruin clothes, ruin shoes, ruin beds. It, it could it could just be it could be a disaster, right? Unless that dog is tamed. And you know in the, in this example, uh, it's very very important to to say that the human that the person is the arbiter. Good word. The, the person is is who decides what's right and what's wrong, and they make the rules of the house. So if that dog is going to you know share a space with that arbiter, that dog will have to succumb to those rules, and succumb to whatever the arbiter decides what's right and wrong. It's the same thing with God. Amen. Or to, or to quote you know to quote Pi, so it is with God. Because of our sins, you know, we've been separated from God and we're out in the wilderness. 
uh, and God wants to and has even invite us, invited us to come live with him, to share in that space, to share in that heavenly space with him. However, because of our wilderness state, because of our depravity, we're a little rough around the edges. Therefore, if we want to follow God, we have to let him tame us. We have to we have to give over authority over ourselves to him and let him subdue, let him master, and let him domesticate us to his standards, to what he says is right and wrong, because he is the arbiter. He decides the rules of the house that we want to share with him. Now that is taming. What However, if, what if you ahead. do that? What if what? You can't tame. Well, Michael, <laughs> see, taming and training really are two sides of the same coin. Okay. 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 And as we as we hear in this last sound clip, on my end at least. Right now? Oh yeah, right now. Yeah, sorry. Oh, so number the because I you I have three sound clips for you. Oh well, okay, sorry. Okay, yes, I forgot about the second. Forgive me. Okay. Uh, Richard Parker, he 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 really can't be tamed. At least not the way that Pi wants to tame him. So of course. This. Oh. So of course. No, 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 you had it. You. Oh, man. Step four. Disregard steps one through three. Oh, I heard him. Ooh. <laughs> See, he was, he was having a hard time taming Richard Parker. So, Pi goes on to a, a different approach. But really, it's, it's, like I said, it's two sides of the same coin. So, let's listen to this third clip and get that in. I can't risk my life every time I have to climb onto the boat for supplies. It's time to settle this. If we're going to live together, we have to learn to communicate. Maybe Richard Parker can't be tamed, but with God's will, he can be trained. Hmm. Aha. So maybe this is, maybe this speaks to what we go through as humans, because if, if Richard Parker does represent the sinful nature, the natural state of man. Maybe we as humans, we can't fully tame that sinful nature. <laughs> uh, possibly by uh, by James and speaking about the tongue. Yeah. Oh, oh, go go on. No, oh, no, no, no. I just that just popped into my head because you know he's such a small little thing, and you know with it, it you know it does all the stuff. Who can tame it? Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so. He says, well, maybe we can't tame the sinful nature. However, we can still coexist with a little training, with a, uh, with a little keeping in check. And now, to train, again, another three-part definition. Okay. To train is to educate, drill, and initiate. Ah. Now, what do I, now, you may ask, Brendan, what do you mean? Brendan. What do you mean? <laughs> Gather around, children. Gather around. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> to educate in regards to training, to educate is to provide the technical knowledge that is the know-how and the how-to for performing a certain task. Makes sense. Okay. Whether that's, uh, you know, not destroying the furniture. Yes. Or, you know, not chewing up clothes. We can, we can be trained to do that. Now... To drill is to in ingrain that performance by repetition and practice. Or, if you're familiar with the theater world, rehearse. This we, sounds, yeah, this sounds very familiar to me. Uh, keep going. Okay, and then to initiate is to allow the subject to engage and perform and act out the will of the master when the time calls for it. Oh, Okay. Okay, yes. Now, hold on. Let me, let me scroll down my spreadsheet here. I am looking forward to your examples on this definition. 
Okay, so well, let's go back to the uh, to the dog and the human. The human educates the dog on what to do and what not to do. The the person and the dog then practice with small and inconsequential situations. Oh, why? In a rehearsal space. Well, because that will give the dog time to be able to perform when the consequences do matter. Uh, oh, man, that goes back to that N.T. Wright quote. That you yes, it does. V virtue. Yes. Yes, th this, this is another look at virtue. Ha <laughs> ha. And in the same way, you know, with, with God and humans, God has educated us and continually does so. And thankfully, we have the best example through Jesus, through his own son, on what to do and what not to do. Wow. And then, this is, okay, this is where I'm going to get a little bold. Oh. But I, but I think, I, I, you know, I, I just, every time I look at it, I think it's true. We are able to practice in what could be considered inconsequential situations by God's grace. And that, because that includes if slash when, and I'm leaning more toward when, we stumble and fall. We can still practice by God's grace. So, when the time calls for it, we can do the right thing. Yes. Which isn't our own thing, it's, it's God's will. That is when it, be, it becomes not selfish, but it becomes God's own will coming through us. Wow. And that, and really that is what this movie is all about. You know, in regards to uh, Richard Parker and Pi. And I would even say that, and here's my key text. Okay. Here, here's the key text. 2 Corinthians 12... 7 through 9. And I'll be reading out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of my revelations, this is, this is Paul speaking, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, and to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he kept saying, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I really think that is what Pi, as the storyteller, is trying to do. Which is, uh, so, and Paul there is just uh, reiterating what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Yeah. Because of that weakness, because this, you know, he just finished talking about the uh, the weakness of God being stronger than men, or the foolishness of God being wiser than men, and and so that ties in so uh, so perfectly. Um, continue the thought. So, so um, well, just this this is Pi boasting in his own weakness because he, in a sense, he confesses that. He could not go without killing somebody on that lifeboat. He's, in a sense, he's confessing a sin. He's confessing a weakness. He is confessing a missing of the mark. However, he is using that, even though he, you know, he doesn't say it in the film. We can, we as Christians, can interpret that as him boasting in his own weakness and letting Christ shine through. Huh. Beautiful. What else? 
Oh, that that's all I had. Okay, well, because Pi and Richard Parker, they're like the peaceful kingdom, in a way. In Isaiah chapter 11, that's one of my very favorite passages. Um, so they're kind of like if you took that 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 parable of the peaceful kingdom and turned it upside down and just made each of these dichotomies the same person. You know what I'm saying? So whether it is uh, you know a lamb or a lion. They're both the same person when you're talking about in the in the kingdom of God and the the transformation that takes place uh, within people's hearts. In fact, let's just go over real quick here um, and just touch on the peaceful kingdom. Um, I've I've mentioned this several times on the show in different contexts, uh, and and like I said, this is really me just having fun with this passage and just turning it upside down a little bit. So um, here we go. What what well what are we looking at? Verses six through nine. The wolf will lie, will live with the lamb. Oh goodness! If they are two sides of the same coin, uh, Richard Park Richard Parker and Pie. They're both, you know, one is the wolf and one is the lamb, but they're the same person and coming together. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. The young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so you have these two people, <laughs> but they're both the same guy, but they're relying on each other in this particular situation. But we can also call this double-minded no more. The life of Pi, and Brendan, you can turn your microphone back on if you'd like to. The life of Pi is the inception of allegory. I don't know when it was that we talked about inception, but remember that's a dream within a dream. Or That, that was back episode, that, that was in the 20s. I do remember wow. that. Yeah. That's a long time ago, and that was a dream within a dream or a dream within a dream within a dream. Well, this is a parable within a parable. Um, Pi has yet to discover the way, you know, the way of Christ, to find Christ. He is the way. But you can use this film to teach. See, even at the end of the film, he still hasn't found Christ. And I'm not going to try and make that uh, make that claim and twist the story around enough to, to fit that in. I just couldn't do it on one viewing. I don't know if it yeah. could be good uh, regardless. But uh, he has yet to find, to discover that. But he is on the path. He's on the path. And I have every, uh, every belief that he will come to a full understanding of who his Savior is, the one who saved him throughout the whole entire movie. Um, so yet, even though he hasn't discovered that, you can use this film to teach who God is as revealed in Jesus the Christ. It's perfect for doing that. Young Pai is influenced by his mother's Hindu faith. He believes in God, but he seeks to know God better. That's just what's in him. It's kind of like you know, God setting eternity in man's hearts. What's that? He please ask me chapter three or um so he has this encounter with a Catholic priest. His older brother dares him, hey, run down into that church and drink the holy water and you'll get this, you know, nickel or whatever. I've I've got two rupees with yeah. your name on it if you go and drink that holy water. <laughs> go. And so he goes down and does that, and then he has this encounter with the Catholic priest. And, and he introduces Pi to the Son of God. You know, a cup of cold water is, is offered by the priest. That's a Christian command. We are, as followers, we are commanded to do that, basically. You know, offer you, at least give a cup of cold water. Do something. And, but the priest takes the opportunity, um, or, or actually Pi takes that opportunity, to get some answers to some hard questions. Why would a God do that? Why would he send his own son to suffer for the sins of ordinary people? Because he loves us. God made himself approachable to us, human, so we could understand him. We can't understand God in all his perfection, but we can understand God's son and his suffering as we would a brother's. That made no sense. Sacrificing the innocent to atone for the sins of the guilty. What kind of love is that? 
that's what the that's the big question. What kind of love is that? That makes no sense. And he's absolutely right, Brendan. That makes no sense. But going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, right off the bat in the NIV, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Very important question because there's no other religion that's like that brendan not that i'm aware of not yeah that I'm... not i I've, i looked through all my books and i couldn't find one what kind of god what kind of love is that oh that's a love that we can't understand the innocent dying for the guilty yes that's the kind of god because not the god that we deserve but, ah! the, but the god that we need Go back and listen to the last episode of Finding Christ in Cinema, episode number 63, The Dark Knight. But this sets Pi on that path, the journey to know God because of his son. But it brings more questions, Brendan, and it even brings further confusion. But this son, I couldn't get him out of my head. If God is so perfect and we are not... Why would he want to create all this? Why does he need us at all? All you have to know is that he loves us. God so loved this world that he gave his only son. The longer I listened this to the priest, God. the more I came to like this son of God. Thank you, Vishnu, for introducing me to Christ. I came to faith through Hinduism, and I found God's love through Christ. But God wasn't finished with me yet. God works in mysterious ways. And so it was he introduced himself again, this time by the name of Allah. So he's on this journey but he's still very confused. And the more that he learns on his journey, the more confused he becomes. And that's because he doesn't stop long enough to consider what it is that he's learning. And, and so we, we come to this point you mentioned, and I said, I have the sound clip. We're going to hear from Pi's father, who's a very wise, if atheistic man. Just because he's an atheist doesn't make him any less wise. In fact, the words that he's going to say to his son, it's almost like the Holy Spirit put them in his mouth because they are powerful words. He challenges Pi on his double-minded approach to religion. You cannot follow three different religions at the same time. Why not? Because believing in everything at the same time is the same as not believing in anything at all. He's young, Santosh. He's still finding his way. And how can he find his way if he does not choose a path? Listen, instead of leaping from one religion to the next, why not start with reason? In a few hundred years, science has taken us farther in understanding the universe than the religion has in 10,000. That is true. Your father is right. Science can teach us more about what is out there, but not what is in here. Yeah, some eat meat, some eat vegetable. I do not expect us all to agree about everything, but I would much rather have you believe in something I don't agree with than to accept everything blindly. And that begins with thinking rationally. He's a he's great, wise words. And it's a powerful point, Brendan. The powerful point, when he says believing in everything at the same time is the same as not believing in anything at all. And the, yeah. chi the children of Israel had a big problem with that. A huge problem throughout their whole history. And it reminds me of Joshua in his famous words in chapter 25, verse 15, where he says, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Choose somebody! whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. His father says, I would much rather have you believe in something I don't agree with than to accept everything 
blindly. So he's actually giving uh, um, Pi the the direction that he needs in order to continue on the path, the path to find God. Uh, um, you know, it. I mean, well, accept everything blindly is what Pi's been doing. Is there such a thing as as blind faith, Brendan? There is, unfortunately, but it doesn't have to exist. Is it biblical? Is the concept of blind faith biblical? No, it's not. No. In fact, God has always given proofs to believe that he is who he says he is. And when people say, you know, I, I mean, look at Moses. You know, well, who am I going to say sent me? You know, tell me I am. Well, but that's not going to be good enough. Well, then do this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All the way down to sending his son, the ultimate revelation, so that Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the ultimate revelation. He gives proofs, so you don't have to have blind faith. You know, James addresses um, doubt, stating that we should expect God, we should, well, we should not expect God to answer us if we doubt or if we uh, uh, as as Pi's father is is teaching him, you know, you can't just believe everything. You can't, because then you don't believe anything. Uh, in fact, James chapter one verses six and through eight, and I'm going to read out of the Common English Bible because it's a great translation of this. Whoever asks shouldn't hesitate; they should ask in faith, without doubting. Whenever doubt or, I'm sorry, whoever doubts is like the surf of the sea, oh, tossed and turned by the wind. Is that conjuring up maybe like the, the whole point of the movie or the, you know, the, 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 the whole second act? Uh, or I don't even know how you, what you would say. I would say everything up to the shipwreck is an epilogue. But... So wh whoever doubts is like the surf of the sea, tossed and turned by the wind. People like that should never imagine that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded, unstable in all their ways. And then comes the trial. So this is the buildup. Then we know what happens and the, and the parable. What is that parable? Uh, pointing to it is it's Pi and Richard Parker and it is Pi fighting with his double minded self because that's what he is he's still got these the, he's the, the, the savage the wild the, the unpredictable the uncontrollable the can I could I say untrainable, or or untamable, untamable perhaps I should say. And that so that is I think that that is really what that whole time on the sea is as he's being tossed and turned and he's really having to come he's having to 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 get rid of his double mindedness and and that's hard to do. But it's interesting that at the very end, when they land on that Mexican coast, Brendan, his old nature walks away and doesn't look back. And what does Pi say? Well, what does he do? <laughs> he mourns. He mourns. He says, I love you. I loved you. But... There's that letting go. And sometimes, well, it, it's not even a letting go. That was a forced letting go. His old nature walks away. They got to where they needed to be. So they were able to, together, to attain the goal. That is faith, endurance, salvation from the horrors of being lost at sea. And Pi learns about the spirit within him. And when the flesh is brought into submission, it, Richard Parker, leaves. 
That's the flesh. He's brought into submission finally. That's a lot like what James is talking about with the tongue, because he says, who can tame the tongue? But then later on he goes, but if you submit yourself to God, and that ties into the definitions that you were presenting us with, uh, Brendan, especially the very first definition, taming, uh, um, you know, is to subdue, to master, to domesticate, conquer, reduce to subjection. That's what we are to do with our sinful nature. Our sinful nature, according to James, really uh, can be... uh, exemplified in the tongue. But in Life of Pi, it's exemplified in the form of a tiger. But through this whole time, this whole catastrophe at sea, we go back to James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Then, Brendan, this is the key text. So when you are sitting on your double-decker couch with your friend or loved one and you are watching Life of Pi, that whole time at sea can be summed up in this these two verses. My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect effect so that you will be perfect and complete not deficient in anything. So, Brennan, come on back. Turn on your microphone. Join me. See if you have anything that you'd like to add to that. Questions, comments, piggybacks, editorials, off-the-wall remarks. Actually, Brendan is no longer with us. I wonder what happened there. (laughs) Uh, So I'm going to go ahead and mark this down here because I'm going to have to edit this out at uh, an hour and 12. Where'd you go? I don't even know. How long have you been gone? Uh, Apparently like a couple minutes. I don't know what happened. Well, okay. So I'll just edit this out. Um, Okay, sorry about that. I don't even know what happened. No, 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 no. It's it's the internet. It happens. Okay. Uh, And so, okay, well then uh, just say... uh, (laughs) Let me get back to my sound cart here. So I asked for comments... Questions, comments, piggybacks, editorials, off-the-wall remarks. You don't even know what my point was, so just say, nope, I think we nailed it. Uh, No, I think we nailed it. All right, how about some listener feedback? Hey, sounds good. Uh, Really quick, uh, because we got some, we definitely got some feedback from Ron of the Red Oaks, patron saint. And we also got some feedback from Philip, from, uh, excuse me, patron saint Philip. Yes. However, uh, this time we got some new feedback from uh, from another guy named uh, Justin Keesling. Justin. Uh, I, yeah, I went to I went to school with him. Went to MTSU. Oh, okay. And we we both served on the uh, student programming uh, committee. Uh, and he and he just sent me a text yesterday saying, "I did not realize how awesome your podcast was." Oh, that's very nice. I, the kids like that. He says, "He says I have episodes to catch up on." And I said, uh, "Cool. What what got you What got you interested?" And he said, "The Dark Knight. Ah. The the trilogy is one of my favorites of all time." Okay. And then he says he's saving Forrest Gump for a long drive. <laughs> hey, but the Dark Knight was the longest episode we have ever done. That is true. That is true. But I think he's already done that one. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I think he's 
he's getting uh, caught up on some back episodes now. Well, Justin, welcome to uh, welcome to the show to the family. Now, please stick around and uh, send some more feedback. It uh, it help it helps more than uh, more than we can tell you. Anything else from him? Uh, no, that's it. But I'm sure we'll be uh, we'll be hearing some more in the future. I sure hope so. Okay, let's go on down to uh, <laughs> our favorite place. Who goes there? It is I, Patron Saint Philip, and uh, well, his King Philip Stables. Yes, he says, uh, great episode, guys. You really taught me a thing or two. And this is regarding the episode on The Dark Knight, our last episode. Wow. I like Brendan's points about God allowing us to suffer as a part of the process that leads to good things. Yes. And Michael talking about Jesus as the God we need rather than deserve. And I think that will be a good point to make to my 10-year-old son when we rewatch The Dark Knight. There you go. There you go. I'm guessing that neither of you have seen The Dark Knight Returns, Part 1 and 2. I haven't. I, yeah, I haven't either. It was a direct-to-video releases back in 2013 that I hear are very faithful to Frank Miller's limited series. Okay, I'm going to have to look those up. Uh, and I, I think that means they're canon, is what wow. I'm hearing. Wow. Uh, let's see, I, I like them both, Philip continues. I think they're two of the best DC's animated movies. Okay. They definitely earn their PG-13 ratings, but don't bleed over into our territory as much as some of their others do. Okay, so pro okay. All right. probably uh, pretty violent, uh, but not uh, overboard. Yeah, yeah. A more in-depth discussion I'd like to hear from you guys that would probably make a good special episode would be regarding content. Ah. Uh, see, this is, he brings up a good point. Okay, let's hear uh, how do you determine what to see, what not to see? How how you determine whether or not to recommend something, et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. uh, this could not, not only involve philosophical discuss discussion, but tools such as sites, apps, et cetera, that you use to be aware of content before you see something. Okay, okay. Uh, also, since Michael is a Gen Xer like me. Am I? And uh, well, that's what he says. Okay. And Brendan is a millennial. <laughs> I I like to I like to hear you, I'd like your different perspectives on how children should be handled. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you right now, Philip. I don't have any children. Uh, however, I do have a a niece that is nine and a half months old, and I've started to get those uh, that those stirrings. <laughs> uh, and especially how your own parents handled what you guys saw and how effective or ineffective, ineffective that was. That would be a fantastic... Uh, that, that might need to be our next special episode. I think so. Okay. Uh, love the show, fellas. Thanks. Hashtag... But we love Kimberly! I had to do it that time. My very first time. Hey, how's it feel? Wow! Is this how you feel all the time? It is. It is. <laughs> That's Pretty a cool. A little uh, tip of the hat to Riley from uh, uh, um, the uh, what are those movies? The with Nicolas Cage, the conspiracy movies. Oh, uh, Riley Poole in uh, yes. National Treasure. Yes, <laughs> that yeah. Um, I, Brendan, we got to do a special episode, and so we are we are booked through up until uh, September. So let's do it before we get to Halloween. Well, no. well, I well, I'll tell you what. Let's let's think about it right now. Next week, we have the Lion King. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, but okay. hey, don't fret, Michael. After that, we get all three original Star Wars movies in a row. So the Lion King is episode sixty-five. Yes. And then we got sixty-six, sixty-seven, sixty-eight for the trilogy. Yes. Sixty-nine. For the Dark Knight Returns or Rises, the Dark Knight Rises, seventy ep ep episode seventy, and then so oh, just bump uh, um, Pacific Rim one week. Yeah, ep episode seventy one will be Pacific Rim. 
Yes, let's do that. And you, oh man, I, I'm over, I'm getting some ideas. I'm getting uh, some me, ideas. Me too. Me okay. too. As we're sitting right now and talking. Yes. While we're producing the show on the fly, I'm yes. already working on special episode number seventy. That's right. Wow. Okay. Yes, uh, Philip. Thank you so much. And as always, your input and your comment, you're just a blessing to us, brother. We are. Uh, just again, we're blessed to have you as a friend. Um, we also have some feedback from patron Saint Ron of the Red Oaks. And, and you know what? He messaged me the other night and it was, you know, Facebook messages and it was private. It was a private um, chat between he and I. And you talk about an, another man, a blessing. I absolutely love Ron of the Red Oaks and he knows how to encourage people. He knows how to lift up and edify and that is a spiritual gift that um, is, uh, we need more uh, people like that in the church. I'm not saying just for finding Christ in cinema, though we do, but <laughs> yeah, well, but yeah. I mean, in general, uh, he's a, a voice of reason. He is a voice of encouragement. He's a voice of comfort. And, um, uh, and he know, again, he knows how to lift people up. Um, and so we had a great conversation back and forth and we got geeky and, and, you know, talking Star Trek and all kinds of things. And, uh, but he did send us a message, uh, on Facebook, uh, on our finding Christ in cinema, Facebook page. Um, and he says, I got some stuff for the list. So some movies that to me were moving and also insightful. So we need to add these to the list, Brendan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Number one is K Pax. Which I've never heard of. I, I've heard of it, and I see it all the time on the shelf at my uh, preferred movie rental house. Not a sponsor. Not a sponsor. Yes, sir. Uh, it's got Kevin Spacey and Jeff Bridges. That's okay. all I can tell you. Say no more. Yes. That's all you have to tell me. Yep. Next up would be Equilibrium, that stars FCC's very own Christian Bale. Have well, you seen that film? I, I thought we didn't like comedians. What? No, that's not that much. It's not, no, 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 no. No, I hate comedians. <laughs> no, that guy hates comedians. Oh, sorry. So, uh, yes, I have seen Equilibrium. It is very cool. Yes, so let's get that on the list. Okay. And, um, number three is Kingdom of Heaven, which should be on the list because I gave Brendan, I gave you uh, the D I think I gave you the DVD to borrow. I hope I did. No, not yet. Oh, okay. Oh, it's down here on the shelf behind me, waiting to give to you. I, okay. And, and uh, Ron, I put that on my uh, on my iPad, and I watched. I only got through seven minutes before I had to turn it off and put it down. And here's the reason why. Was it that bad of a movie? No, I I was already seven minutes into it. Going, oh man, this is epic already. I mean, just setting up the premise, it was beyond epic, and I can't. I don't know if I can handle this movie, but I, I got to watch it. I need some time because I know it has a, a bunch of my favorite people. It takes place in a favorite period of time. It's just winter, winter, chicken dinner written all over this thing. And huh. so that we will definitely get to that. Uh, and then he says, and just for a trip down memory lane, <laughs> this ties into our, our chat the other night, Star Trek uh, number four, The Voyage Home. And that has to do with God or a God-like figure, uh, and so I'm all you know. It's Star Trek, man, and it's original. It's uh, it's the real Star Trek people. So we'll get that on the list as well. Wait, would Jeremiah or of the Theonauts consider it real Star Trek? Does it matter though? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't listen to the show. It doesn't matter what he. Yeah, does. yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. <laughs> so there you go. And uh, that was uh, that's about it for the feedback this week. Anything else? Did I miss anything? No, that's it. All right, here you go, listeners. What Christian themes did you find in Life of Pi? This movie's fat, just like many and most of the movies that we that we watch. It is large with Christian themes. Um, we could go, man, Brendan. I wanted to talk about that island. That okay now that island that is something that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Oh man, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the uh, the waters that were the bitter waters uh, at the wilderness wanderings as they as they left, and uh, uh, and then you know, the children of Israel complaining and so and then God 
you know, uh, po uh, points Moses to a to a log, throw this in the water, throws it in there, and it made the water sweet. And and, uh, and so you know that tied into the rock that followed them through the wilderness wanderings. That rock, that spiritual rock, which was Christ, as Paul tells us. You know, so they're in death. They're surrounded by death, the desert, and then. But yet, here's this this little oasis, for you know, lack of better terms, that's following them, and it has yeah. to do with water. You know, both of those incidences, water, and and of course, you could tie in the um, uh, the 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 manna or sending uh, the quail. We have no food. The quail. You know, it, watching Richard Parker run around just. Picking off little meerkats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so really that's the images that it conjured up in my mind. That's I wanted to go with that, but uh, we'll leave that for somebody else to flesh out. Uh, yes, a, lot of good, yes, a lot of good themes in this movie. So share them with us and we'll share them with the listeners and we'll all have a good time. Anything else uh, regarding the listener challenge that I may have forgotten? Uh, no, you got it. Are you ready for some? Well-mannered frivolity. Michael. Yeah. Twain's Tales is over. It's over? Yes. Never the Twain shall meet? Oh, I didn't even use that joke once. <laughs> I'm proud of myself. Oh, you hurt me. Oh, what sorry. I uh, it, it went better than I expected. And, and Michael, you know me, super critical... Yeah. Super an super analytical, um, the, but the kids really pulled through. That's awesome. And yeah. Yes, yeah, good job on them. Uh, I want to share this brief moment uh, with you guys, with everyone, because this was hilarious. So, okay, so the Thursday afternoon performance, we had we have a little preview performance, and the, you know that went well. That was that was pretty cool. Friday night, however, was the opening night. And uh, with the play being divided up into, into six different scenes, six different Mark Twain stories, they mix up and they skip over the third scene. Oh, no! And go right into the fourth scene. Uh-oh! But what happened on stage, Michael was magic because they went back and covered it geniusly. Oh. And I was I was just I was so proud. That is awesome. That and that's what live theater is all about. And that is what life is all about. Yeah. Wow. It, so it I mean, was just a magical moment. Because you know what what is the what's the um the tendency when something like that happens, and I spent years on stages performing, uh, and and mistakes happen. Yeah. What what you do with that mistake is what's is, is the most important thing of it's, anything. It's it's your response, right? Because that's what counts. Do you just stop and like lay down and give up, or say no. I'm never doing that ever again? That was the most horrible thing ever. Or you pick up where you were and continue, you know, it, it, it really is the old, you know, if you fall off a horse, get bucked, you got to get right back on. Yep. Um, but when you're able to do it and, and to do it seamlessly, that is, that's art. There's an art to that. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, and like I said, those kids pulled through that is see, and they can be proud of that. They can, whoops, sorry, Theonauts. They can have uh, <laughs> 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 no, which is a good kind of a of a pride. They can be proud that they didn't give up uh, and stop. You know, I mean, you, that's the total deer in the headlights moment right there. <laughs> We've all experienced that. All of us that are performers, Brendan, huh? That 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 feeling when you know, oh no, what am I gonna do? And the gears start uh, start smoking in your brain as a uh, you know. Yeah. Anyway, good. Uh, hey, well, I want to mention, uh, speaking of Brendan Taylor, that uh, that Brendan was featured in his local newspaper in the, uh, what section was that? Was that? Uh, oh, the Life and Leisure. 
the, that's where the funny pa- the comics are. Uh, no, it's different. <laughs> but so Waka, like, Waka. So tell us about this uh, little expose, Brendan. Oh, it was just it was just a little uh, a little interview that another another woman that I've you know performed with a few times. Uh, she's a freelance writer for the Times Gazette, for the Shelbyville Times Gazette, and uh, she she just wanted to do a little story, uh, yep. asking about uh, you know what it was like being you know volunteering at the fly, you know being a a theater committee member, and then uh, you know what else do I do? And I you know I mentioned the podcast, mentioned the blog, and you know went you know went from there. It was a great uh, little article. We posted a link to it on our Facebook page and our Twitter account, and uh, uh, we'll get a, a scan of the actual newspaper itself and add that to the website at Christian Cinema uh, on our About page, uh, where you can also see the, uh, the article that was written on Brendan and I from FCC's very own John Carney. John Carney, yeah. Back when we uh, first started this podcast. so, mm-hmm. so FCC- Which... Huh. He, I was gonna say, he by the way is uh, is now starring in the next play at the Fly. Awesome! It's it's a it's a Woody Allen comedy. Don't drink the water. Okay, we need to get so, you in the studio again. Yeah, we do. So you 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 uh, get on him about that. Have you seen any movies? Uh, yes, Michael. With all this free time that I have. Nice. Uh, I, I've actually seen a lot. But the one I really want to talk about really quick, because it will be the next Monday movie review. Yay! Uh, is Ant-Man. Oh! Ant-Man's out? Ant-Man is out, sir. What do you think? Oh, it was awesome. Is it awesome like uh, like uh, Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy kind of awesome? or? Uh, I would say almost kind of in the same way. I mean, like quirky and like where, you know... What's well, story? yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, just to illustrate, Guardians of the Galaxy, it kind of took audiences to a to another world because it happened mainly in outer space. Right. The same kind of effect happens in Ant Man, except the whole another world isn't outer space. It's just on a microscopic level. It's inner space. It's inner space. It's very inner space. Wow. It's in micro space. And it's uh, you know it's really fun. Paul Rudd does an excellent job. However, I will say, Paul Rudd is not Hank Pym. Okay. And I think with Ant Man, uh, Marvel is trying to is is trying to lay the groundwork for the Pym particle. Ah. And I and I think the Pym particle will play a heavy role in Phase Three. Oh wow! So we're gonna get a whole lot more of that. Awesome! And and of course, as always with Marvel movies, stay stay after the credits, after all the credits. Okay. Because, sir, I, oh my goodness, I can't. I'm getting excited telling you about it, uh, but I'm I am not going to spoil that. I'm going to let you guys go watch it for yourselves, and then we'll talk about it. All right, me and uh, uh me and the boy may go and see it this weekend. Or yes, uh, boy and I, I should say. Sorry, sorry, honey, if you're listening. <laughs> Good deal. All right. So I'm looking forward to a Monday movie review on Marvel's Ant Man starring Paul Rudd. Good for you, Paul, for being older than me. I really appreciate it. The Lightning Round! Hey, real quick. Uh, so this past week, uh, our old pal John Wilkerson of the WiredHomeschool.com podcast we were uh we were talking on on twitter and you know hey we're not connected on on facebook so let's do a little experiment neither one of us we're both very private people when it comes to our facebook account and um he and i have our account locked down so tight that we were not even able to friend each other we weren't able to even request a friendship (laughs) and so what i what i'm Doing this lightning round for is to remind you folks that are uh, that, that uh, privacy is important to you, especially on Facebook, because you never know what companies are seeing your uh, your posts or any of that kind of stuff. You know, you just want to keep it personal between you and your family and your friends. You go into the settings, um, you can lock it down really tight. Uh, very happy with that. Um, like I said, you know, John even described it as we were like a 
we're having a standoff, this privacy standoff <laughs> on Facebook. So go in there, double check your settings. Um, you can you can determine who can even send you friend re requests. And uh, see, that was the problem was because the um, well, the, the the strictest setting, which I wish there was a stricter setting. I wish you could set it to nobody's allowed to send me friend requests. But um, the strictest is allow friends of friends. Well, John and I both had ours set to that, and we don't have any mutual friends on Facebook, so therefore we were not allowed to even send a request to each other. Huh. And uh, so I found that I was very pleased because the, I have been very vocal about um, Facebook and their privacy issues, and I will continue to be because they still do. Uh, they'll give out whatever information any companies want on you. Um, but uh, but at the very least, if you want to keep, you know, some people, maybe you just want to use your Facebook account for your family. So you can post pictures of the kids and all that kind of stuff and not have to worry about who's seeing or who has access uh, to your stuff. You can certainly do that. So go into your Facebook settings, your privacy settings, and that's about it. Um, so just a reminder on that. Brendan, do you have a lightning round of any sort? Uh, well, I I had one in mind, but I think on my end because of battery life. All right, uh, we'll just skip. So, <laughs> okay. So again, uh, run down uh, quickly. What's upcoming on Finding Christ in Cinema? Well, episode sixty-five will be The Lion King, much to Michael's dismay. No! Well, she's not happy either. Well, well, she's just an external expression of how you feel, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then after that, 66, 67, and 68 will be the original Star Wars trilogy. La 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 The best news, best news since the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And then after that, episode 69, we're going to finish the Dark Knight trilogy with the Dark Knight Rises. All right. And then, as we just determined on this episode right here, episode it's a 70. episode! Yes, we will be uh, we're having a special episode, and uh, we'll just be discussing how we, how we choose what we, what we ingest. All right. Content-wise, not food-wise, but content-wise. There you go. And then we'll uh, start the, uh, the 70s with episode number 71. Oh, uh, with uh, Pacific Rim. All right, man, and then that should get us close up to uh, closer to October. Yes, sir. And then we'll determine what we're going to do for Halloween. Because last year we didn't even have anything for anything special for Halloween. We didn't do no Halloween stuff, but friends, whatever takes place, it's all right here. Finding Christ in Cinema. We're live in the GCT Network Studio each Thursday, Lord willing, at around three p.m. Central Time. So you can join us for live video and especially the chat room. Using the chat and video player at gcpnetwork.com slash live. Finding Christ in Cinema is part of the Great Commission Transmission Network, a listener-supported ministry using new media and social networking to equip and encourage you to go into all the world and proclaim the good news to everyone. To find out more and to partner with us, visit us at gctnetwork.com slash donate for all things finding christ in cinema our podcast monday movie reviews links to all the social networking sites that we're involved in get over to our website at christincinema.com you can send email to fcc at gctnetwork.com you can call us up on the voice line at 507-407-GCTN and if for some reason that voice line is broken you can call our backup emergency voice line at 507-407-4286. Now, oh, oh, excuse me. Now, let's say you want to listen to the good old podcast, and uh, your jokes really are that bad. Oh, not, not mine. I thought my jokes were bad. But you don't like comedians. Who does? Nobody around here. You know I hate comedians. And if you're, if you're trying to hit me, you know, hit me. Come on, stop trying to hit me and hit me. You can go to iTunes, you can go to Stitcher, and you can go to TuneIn Radio. Search them all for Finding Christ in Cinema. That's just as fascinating as the first 89 times you told me that. And for all the content and shows that we produce here at the Great Commission Transmission Network, including the Theonauts, which I guest hosted this week, talking about hell, 
get over to gctnetwork.com. Brendan Taylor, anything else? This really needs to not happen anymore. Okay. <laughs> the Google Hangouts. Of your bursting. No more Google Hangouts. And that is a wrap. You are a sad, strange little man. Potato. It's pretty mind-blowing. Sandimental hogwash. One does not simply walk into Mordor. There's no such thing as magic. It's a man out! A man out! I told you he was tricksy. All right. All right. Okie doke. So, that little hiccup in the middle of the show notwithstanding, that wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. No, not at um, all. Okay, let me... Let me get off with you here. The uh, the shop called okay. a couple a couple times. I, I don't have an intro written. Let me talk to them, and then I'll get back to you, okay? Got it. Okay, all right. Bye-bye for now. TTFN, ta-ta for now. <laughs>